president of Beth Shalom Synagogue. We are so pleased to be presenting a new season of Evenings with Steve. Tonight, his special guest is Lord Conrad Black. Today's presentation is being co-sponsored by Beth Sholem and eight other synagogues, Adith Israel, Beth Raim, Beth Emeth, Beth Yehuda, Beth Radom, Beth Tikva, Beth Torah, Beth Sedek, and Kahilat Beth Israel in Ottawa. I'm so proud to represent the other presidents of these synagogues. What began as a working group, we first connected at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic with an ambitious agenda. We discussed in weekly meetings how best to cope with common challenges that we were collectively facing and tackling, best practices employed by each of our respective congregations, and how we were intending to launch and facilitate virtual online daily services with, and weekly Shabbat services, and what to do about the upcoming high holiday services in 2020. All of our efforts were amidst, uh, amidst the government's changing guidelines and, by, and bylaws, which were so frequent that we had to react and revise our procedures regularly, sometimes even daily. We continue to meet each week, to each every other week, to discuss what we can do as a united community, to work together in collaboration with one another, to present unique programming and events to our congregations and all of our members as communicated through our bulletins, communiques, websites, and social media platforms. We have two very interesting programs scheduled for January, so please check your synagogue's website or bulletins or social media to, for more details. I look forward to seeing you at future events. Our respective synagogues are committed to be there for you during times of joy, in times of sorrow, and they remain dedicated to you now in this time of crisis. We've come to appreciate the power of community and what a wonderful Jewish community we have here in Toronto, in Ottawa, and throughout our great nation. Now about tonight's program. Steven Skirka is a well-known and respected criminal lawyer in Canada. One of his famous cases was defending D. Brown, a Toronto Raptor, in a landmark case on racial profiling. Steve is an author as well. He wrote a book about Conrad Black's trial in Chicago while he was covering it as a legal analyst for CTV News. Did you introduce me? Because we yeah. can't hear you. I'm sorry. Was I muted? Yeah, but that's fine. <laughs> they'll, they'll, they'll just have to wonder about my background. That's all. It's okay. No, no thank you, Abe. You're, you're wonderful. And um, I just want to welcome everyone. And, and you know, thank, thank Abe, President Abe Galinsky, who's, who's just done a tremendous job uh, during this time of crisis in our community and our, in our country and the world. Uh, my name's Steve Skirka. And I'm the host of Evenings with Steve, and uh, we're going to try to present dynamic programs each and every time, every two weeks. Uh, we'll see how long we go. Uh, I hope it's insightful, entertaining. Um, and I, I want to make it clear because, you know, there's some question about are we giving platforms to some of the people we invite? This isn't an issue about platforms. The synagogue should be a forum for a robust discussion, engaging ideas of different kinds. And that's what this is. And in particular, we're going to start with exactly that kind of program. Uh, let me introduce our first guest, Conrad Black, Lord Black of Cross Harbor. And I, I want you to know, Conrad, uh, I remember our first time that we met in Chicago outside, outside the courtroom before the trial began. And I went up to you and introduced myself. And I, I, I wasn't sure what to call you. And you said to me, don't worry, Steve, it's just Conrad, and I, and I appreciated that. So welcome to the program and welcome um, to be our first guest. Thank you very much, Steve, glad to be with you. And as we were chatting before, uh, I, I, I'm familiar with a number of the participating synagogues, and so I, I, I'm sure in some cases I'm speaking with people that have heard me before, and it's, I'm glad to be back with you. All right. So I'm not going to give you a, a long introduction because uh, you're so well known and, and the very the many not always for the right reason. Well, I know. but we're we're going to get to everything in, in this in this discussion. But 
Um, and you know, one of the things people don't know about you is you, have, you do have a wonderful sense of humor. So you're, you're an historian. You wrote a book about Franklin Delano Roosevelt, one of the great presidents in American history. And I wanted to focus on the most pressing issue of our time, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. We have um, FDR, as he was known, confronting the two great catastrophes of the previous century, the, the Depression and the Second World War. I suppose you could put the First World War as, a, as an additional catastrophe, but certainly two of the three. And he confronted them and he overcame them against all laws. And I'm just wondering, when you look at our COVID pandemic, how do you think a leader like FDR would have approached it? Well, he had a specific technique. And incidentally, well, he was not the leader. He did have a prominent role in the American effort in World War I as Assistant Secretary of the Navy. And he really knew about the Navy and basically ran the Navy. The Secretary, Mr. Daniels, was a political appointee. But uh, I mean, a capable man, but really FDR ran the US Navy uh, on behalf of the president whom he served, Woodrow Wilson. But um, uh, his technique as president was when a crisis arose, and as you said, he came into office with a terrible economic crisis. The economic system had collapsed. The unemployment rate was 30%, approximately 17 million people in a population of 125 million, and there was no direct federal relief for them. They could, they could beg, steal, or starve. That was the choice. And uh, the, the entire system had shut down. Banks were closed in 46 out of 48 states. The stock and commodity exchanges had all been closed for some time, over a week. And, and that's what he faced. And so he, he, after his famous inaugural address with the most familiar words, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself, uh, he uh, reopened the banks and issued a special currency to the banks in order to make sure that there were no runs that would shut the banks down and bank failures would not happen. So that, that reduced panic. And then under the aegis of the Federal Reserve, they merged banks that had solvency problems and guaranteed bank deposits and, and the crisis subsided. And the, and the United States government became by far the biggest shareholder in the banking system, but preferred shareholders, not vote, not voting shareholders. And, and, and their, their preferred shares were redeemed out over the next several years at a profit to the taxpayer without the government telling the bankers how to do their business. Now, his technique was to come up with a plan of action and present it to the people. And he, he was the first political figure in North America to use the radio very extensively. And he had what was called by the media fireside chats, would be familiar to the more venerable of your, of your uh, viewers. And, 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 and he, he would put it to them directly as if he was sitting there in their living rooms talking to them. And it was a very effective technique. He was a wonderful speaker, as you know. I'm mean, sure everybody has heard him. He's a very mellifluous, articulate man but with a, with a very educated and patrician, but euphonious inflection. And, uh, he, and, and that I think is how, how he would have dealt with COVID. He wouldn't have been stampeded by the scientists, but would have come up with a plan of action and explained it and, and asked the country to cooperate with it. Now, it must be said, he throughout his time, four terms as president, um, he, he enjoyed the support of the media and he always had a majority of public opinion behind him. In fairness to the incumbent president of the US, he's been sandbagged by the media and he hasn't always done himself favors in the way he's handled things uh, and, and for their own reasons. And it's not for me to uh, impute motives to, to a large number of people and to take it upon myself to mind read the entire American national political media, but it is hard to escape the impression that they set out to create a state of panic in order to force an economic shutdown that would be politically advantageous to the Democrats. And that was what Trump was contending with. But, but in the, the, you know, your question was what FDR would have done. And, I, I, and he, would have, he would have analyzed it carefully, come up with a plan of action and delivered it and asked for public cooperation and support. I suspect that he would have been a little hesitant about plunging into a shutdown and would have emphasized more once there was any research at all indicating that the 
the, the um, virus was fatal to a very small number of people beneath the age of 65, that to segregate, medically speaking, and protect the vulnerable, but let the rest of the country get on as normally as they could. And, and in fairness to Trump, he has tried to do that compared to the other voices in the political arena. Uh, but I, he would have avoided the incoherence that Trump has had, and he never would have had a fiasco like those daily press briefings where President Trump shouldered the vice president, who was ostensibly the chairman of his special commission, aside and, and got into these terrible and undignified debates where he was baited by members of the press in, in a manner that was really a disgrace. All right. Well, I'm going to come back to some questions about Donald Trump. I mean, it's it's unavoidable. We have to we have to deal with them uh, during this this hour. But I, I want to turn to another subject, and that is uh, your views on the state of Israel. And I'm not sure everyone appreciates that uh, your media company uh, owned the Jerusalem Post. And also, when you own the Telegraph in England, the company, uh, during the Lebanon War, your newspaper was one of the few newspapers in Britain uh, that staunchly supported the state of Israel. You've written about it. You've expressed strong, um, very strong views, uh, consistently supportive of, of the state of Israel. And I just wanted to ask you why that is. Why do you feel um, that it's so important to stand behind uh, that tiny state in the Middle East? Well, as you have kindly mentioned, I am a historian and, and, um, and I've studied a, a good deal of ancient history too. And uh, anyone who's read reasonably extensively of the history of the West is aware of the extreme difficulties of the Jewish people over a very long time. And um, I think the whole concept of Israel was in the first place, a, a romantic and dramatic concept that the Jewish people should have their own state. And in the second place, I think it could be seen, I was a baby at the end of the Second World War, but uh, as the revelations came out of the horrible toll uh, that the, the, the Jews paid as in addition to millions of others uh, in, in, in simply being liquidated for no color excuse whatsoever, um, it was a necessary thing and almost too late to give the Jewish people a sanctuary of their own where they simply could not be oppressed. And most people are not aware, or if they were aware, they have forgotten that Israel possesses a degree of legitimacy that no other country does. The founding members of the United Nations, the United States, United Kingdom, the then Soviet Union, China and pre-communist China and France, uh, with a majority vote in the General Assembly, but unanimous among the permanent members of the Security Council, indeed on a motion of Stalin's ambassador, seconded by Truman's ambassador, established Israel as a Jewish state. That was the raison d'etre of the country. Now, it was understood that non-Jews living in Israel, would, would their rights would be respected. And there's some debate about whether that uh, obligation has been entirely satisfied. But, but the fact is it was established as a Jewish state. There was both a realistic geopolitical necessity after the horrible oppression and genocidal assault the Jews had, had endured. And there was a romantic and dramatic historic cultural reason for this country that could not be claimed, frankly, by most of the 197 members of the United Nations. And I'm only using UN membership as indicative of statehood. I, mean, I think uh, Taiwan should be a member too, but that's, that's a completely unrelated issue. And therefore, I think Israel is in the first place, a romantically interesting concept. In the second place, a necessity and an act of international justice after horrible and unimaginable injustices were inflicted on the Jews. And in addition to others, I mean, I think frankly, sometimes uh, my Jewish friends underestimate the degree of solidarity that Jews had with the rest of us who helped nationalities and peoples who helped win the war against the Nazis. Uh, but uh, it is also a very interesting and very successful country. I mean, when it was set up in 1948, it was to quote, uh, allegedly Pontius Pilate, 
a, a land of sand to camels and Jehovah. Uh, I mean, it was a, a battered and primitive country. And today its standard of living is really quite close to Canada's. It's, it's a, it's a, has a European, Western European standard of living, higher than Greece or Portugal, for example. And, and Israel has been assisted by overseas Jews and it's been assisted by the United States and so forth, but it is a remarkable success story. So I think you have all elements here. You have absolute legitimacy. You have a, 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 a moving romantic historic story and you have a highly successful country. And I have no ill feeling to those who contend against Israel, as long as they don't resort to extremes. But the case for Israel as a Jewish state is completely unassailable. And I've always held the view ever since I had opinions on the subject that Israel should not enter into any substantive negotiations with any country that does not admit the right of Israel to exist as, as a Jewish state. There's room for discussion about the borders. But Israel's right to exist, as far as I'm concerned, is not something that anyone has any standing to negotiate. Right. Before I ask the next question, Connor, I just want to tell our audience that we do have a chat room. I won't be able to get all the questions, but this is an interactive uh, session. It will always be that case. So please forward your questions. I'll read them uh, as I can. And I promise you that I'll ask some of them during the course of our session. So, so Connor, I, I'm just... Moving, staying on the topic of Israel, but shifting sideways, I, I'm, I'm just in the middle of reading a, a wonderful book uh, by Margaret McMillan, Professor McMillan, and it's called War, How Conflict Shaped Us. And, and one of her uh, basic positions in the book is that war has existed. The evidence indicates uh, that there's a tendency of human beings to engage in war since civilization began. And, and I, I would say that the same thing likely applies to racism, bigot, bigotry, and discrimination. And, and I, I would say that as long as the Jewish people have existed, the evidence is that we have confronted uh, the scourge of, of anti-Semitism. And, and today it manifests itself in a different way, both on the right and the left, disguised as anti-Zionism, which uh, is clearly uh, anti-Semitism. So I just wanted to know if you have any thoughts, first of all, on why it's so inbred, why it continues um, like a virus to spread, and, and the way that societies and governments try to regulate it. For example, in Canada, uh, we have far more restrictive and rigorous laws about hate crimes than they do in America. I'm not sure they work, but is, is that the right approach? And I'd be very interested to hear your views on that. Uh, you put a number of questions there, Steve. Um, Margaret McMillan has been a friend of mine for 55 years, and she's a very capable historian, good friend and a very capable historian, but I've not unfortunately got to that book yet. Um, but I have read a good deal of uh, classical history and, and to some degree ancient history. And it is the case that in earlier times and in, 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 in the ancient world, the majority of identifiable groups did fight other groups. It, it came very naturally to them. And, and, and to the extent that we've managed to mitigate that these past 3,000 years or more is a progress. And it's very appreciable progress. I mean, all of these ancient peoples, uh, practically the Hittites and, and the Assyrians, even the Babylonians who were a little more contemplative, um, uh, uh, all the tribes and peoples that came out of Central Europe and ultimately overran the Western Roman Empire, they, they all attacked their neighbors just on principle because they weren't them and, they, and they, they just fought with them the way some types of dogs fight with other dogs when they encounter them uh, on the sidewalk. And um, that unfortunately was human nature and that's what we're trying to deal with. I, I must tell you, the Jews themselves were fairly belligerent at times. I, I mean, I, I can't tell you, Steve, the, the Jewish people in earliest times were, were always completely self-contained and never assertive opposite uh, their neighbors. But, but that's not the point. They, you know, th this was human nature as far as we know it at the start. And, uh, and the Roman Empire, for all its failings, actually expanded relatively accidentally. I mean, they were provoked by Carthage. And then what, and, and I mean, we know this can be an endless subject that could have us here all night and I won't inflict it or even a tiny part of it on you, but Rome 
essentially expanded when it felt endangered. Uh, but, it, it, and, and that, you know, it was more responsible than most great powers in history in that regard. Now, I think, and it is partly because humans have learned something because of the terrible needless casualties we've taken in these appalling wars and because weapons have become so destructive and dangerous. But I hope also because there's a bit more of a pattern of refined contemplation of what the role of government and the uh, evident diversity of a vast number of nationalities and other groups uh, requires. Uh, uh, that the things have settled down and are, are much more civilized than in any previous era. And the greatest power in the world, the United States, is not one that has ever gone to a place where it wasn't welcome in terms of occupying it durably. I mean, they landed in the eastern shore of this continent and occupied the middle of the continent. Uh, I, I don't want to get into the business of indigenous rights, but the native people there, as in this country, were not occupying those countries. There was a relatively small number of them, 200,000 in Canada and perhaps a million in the US. That's not occupying North America. And, and, and the Americans occupied and peopled the country they have. They, despite their great power, they've never taken over other countries, which they could easily have done militarily, including this one. And, and so it is a different type of world organization than, than in ancient times. On the matter of um, this dispute, a legitimate dispute between those concerned with the incitement of group uh, hostility, racial or sectarian hostility, uh, and, and those concerned with freedom of expression, it, both sides have a legitimate argument. And as societies, we simply have to work it out. I think that the human rights councils and commissions have been oppressive. I think they're excessive. And I think we simply have to tolerate the fact that people are entitled to think negative things about other groups as they are about other people. And they are up to a point entitled to express them. If somebody doesn't like Jews or doesn't like take my case, you know, Anglo-Saxons or Roman Catholics, they have a perfect right to say that. And it just as they have a right to say they don't like me. There's nothing wrong as it's distasteful, I, I mean, about anybody, but, but we, we simply have to tolerate it up to a point. But uh, I think we need more precise criteria, less subject to possible abuse and oppression in what constitutes incitement to racial hatred and a potential incitement to violence. We've seen real violence, though, and we've seen real violence in synagogues and, and violence manifesting itself across. The world. Those are those are absolutely unquestioned crimes. I mean, you're talking about bombings and shootings in synagogues and in some churches. Absolutely, unquestionably, criminal acts that should be prosecuted with extreme severity, and in, and generally are. By the way, I, I'm going to build on a question from the chat room that was asked um, by um, Ryan, and. Um, his question was about the American criminal justice system, but let me just put it in context because you are a great admirer of the United States, a great admirer of America. So why has um, the criminal justice system failed so abysmally? Uh, it's a failing of that country. I mean, it, it is without any question, I think, by, by almost any measurement, the greatest country in the history of the world. There has never been in all of history, anything remotely like the rise of the United States in two long lifetimes, two people living to be in their early 80s, from the Battle of Yorktown ending the Revolutionary War to the end of World War II, when the United States grew from two and a half million people and 800, 000, I mean, free people and 800,000 slaves to, to a country that had, at the end of, you know, war ravaged world of 1945, it had half the economic product of the world and, and uh, had a nuclear monopoly and by far the highest standard of living in the world. And its leaders, uh, civilian and military, Roosevelt, Truman, MacArthur, Eisenhower, Marshall, Nimitz were overwhelmingly successful and admired throughout the world. And they put in place the institutions, all of the international institutions that still serve us, however, inadequately, like the United Nations, the uh, uh, International Monetary Fund, and when it came time to try and contain the Soviet Union and persuade the Russian leaders to adhere to what they'd promised at Tehran and Yalta, the North Atlantic Treaty and the Marshall Plan. And, um, 
and, and there, it, it was an astonishing rise of the country. And they've generally maintained their position in, in the uh, 75 years since the end of World War II. Uh, but with that said, we have to remember, I mean, those of us who are interested in the U.S., it is, in many respects, a jungle. The strength and the weakness of the United States is that behind the facade portrayed by Norman Rockwell or Walt Disney or Grandma Moses or a lot of other people, it is a jungle. And, 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 that, and the strength of that is this tremendous competitiveness and very high levels of achievement in almost every human field. We've seen it with the development of this vaccine, for example, far more quickly than it ever been done before. Uh, but the negative part is that like all jungles, it's run by the 30 foot constricting snakes and the 700 pound cats. And a great many people are ground to powder. I mean, I'm not a socialist, but, uh, but it, there are millions of people who are simply trampled underfoot in the American system, and the Justice Department is part of it. Now, the U.S. is a democracy, and they're going to run it any way they want. But it, I think in this case, the American mythos has been such that it's largely glossed over the facts of their justice system. It's a 98% conviction rate, a uh, uh, 95% without a trial. I mean, I was a freakish character to actually go to trial. Uh, because of the ability of American prosecutors to manipulate the plea bargain system and extort or suborn inculpatory testimony that is false while guaranteeing no prosecution for perjury from those whom they have threatened with prosecution if they don't provide that evidence. And, uh, and, and uh, at the consequence is the United States has six to 12 times as many incarcerated people per capita as Australia, Canada, France, Germany, Japan, and the United Kingdom. Those are the six closest comparable large prosperous democracies. And, and uh, they have uh, what, uh, 20, uh, 1 20th, 5% of the population of the world and 25% of the world's incarcerated people. Now this is in, you know, sweet land of liberty. There are problems in that country and, and, and the Americans are in some respects very hesitant to come to grips with, with the disagreeable facts of their existence. It's a magnificent country and we must never fail to remember and be grateful for the fact that we owe chiefly to the United States, the comparative triumph of democracy and the free market in the world. Once they decided that they were under threat from the Soviet Union, they devised a containment strategy, called their allies and themselves the free world, even though it included a, all the despots of Latin America and the Shah of Iran and the House of Saud and General Franco and Salazar and Syngman Rhee and uh, Chiang Kai-shek and a lot of other people who weren't in fact champions of freedom. B but almost all those countries became democratic countries and the Americans led us all to victory. And it's a great thing, uh, but it's not a perfect country. And, and, and uh, you know, the, but it is what it is, and it's a democracy, and they run it the way they want it. Conrad, you, you mentioned your trial, and of course, I was there. I covered it and wrote, wrote a book about it. Uh, and two of the, your co-defendants, uh, John Bolpe and Peter Atkinson, were granted pardons by President Trump about two yeah, weeks. And ago. the other co-defendant was acquitted, ultimately, of course, as Mark a result of my actions at the Supreme Court. Yeah, and uh, that was... I mean, there were travesties around, but that one was on a, on a throne of its own, as far as I'm concerned, Mark Kipnis. Um, but but it, what was extraordinary about these pardons, because they were, they were missed because there were a number of very high profile defendants, uh, Roger Stone, Paul Manafort granted pardons on the same day, was that you, Conrad Black, were noted in the media as basically being involved uh, in the process of lobbying on, on behalf of these men. Um, like, did you have a personal conversation with Donald Trump telling him that these people uh, deserve pardons? Uh, they both asked me, Jack Bolton and Peter Atkinson, after the, the, my pardon was announced, uh, if I could give them advice on how one went about applying for one. So I, I gave them that advice. And then they asked me to write a supporting letter for them, which I did. That was, that was all I did. I, you know, the huge number of letters arrived at the White House every day. And, and uh, mine was one of them in each case. Uh, what did happen was um, a few weeks ago, uh, I, I guess the president was getting the look at pardons because it, it appears that his term is ending. And um, 
And because I, it was mentioned to him that I was a supporter of one of them, he, he was gracious enough to telephone me. And, and he said, look, I followed your case and I know the charges against you were bunk. And I, I, I just want to be sure here, I don't want a mistake. I, 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 these people appear to have, it's actually just Bolte was familiar with at that point, but I, I mentioned Peter Atkinson and I said the fact situation would be very similar with this. Uh, he said the, 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 they appear to have a good case but, uh, you know, I, 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 look, I, I like to be helpful here, but I don't want to pardon people that I think are completely guilty, or at least I, you can either pardon them because you think they've been, been you know, paid their so-called debt to society, didn't use that phrase, or you can pardon them because you think they were never guilty in the first place. Now, are these guys in the same position as you? I, I mean, were they not guilty? And I, my actual words were, Mr. President, they no more committed crimes than Melania did. So he, there was a pause of about two seconds. And he said, well, you can tell them that I'll sign their pardons tonight. And he did. And they weren't. They were not guilty. They were only indicted because the prosecutors were after me. And, and they couldn't indict me without indicting my vice president legal and vice president finance. But they were completely innocent. And that is illustrative. Uh, and by, so was I, by the way, of how the American system works. It's a shambles. But these prosecutors just do what they want. Now, you said Donald Trump knew, knew about your case. I don't know how many people are aware of this, uh, but Eddie Greenspan, um, one of your lawyers, had actually intended to call Donald Trump as a witness as your trial. And for various reasons, which we won't go into tonight, he, he wasn't called, but he was ready, able, and willing to step he, into he that. He volunteered court. to come. I know that. And it wasn't easy to be a witness in your trial. It wasn't easy to stand up in that courtroom and testify on behalf of Conrad Black. And um, so, so you've known him a long time. He was also involved at some of the shareholders meetings, speaking up on behalf of you and, and Radler. Uh, longstanding history with him. You both have or had um, neighboring properties in, uh, in Palm Beach. So how would you describe um, your relationship with um, Donald Trump over the years? Are you friends, close friends, acquaintances? What is it? A cordial, cordial acquaintances. He, he, friends in the sense of certainly being friendly, but uh, you know, because of the great office he's held, I've only had a few conversations with him all the time he's been there. Um, uh, but before that, when I, you know, and before all my legal problems, I used to see him quite often and we were neighbors in New York too. So, uh, you know, we had dinner with them sometimes. And, but, but, you know, between my legal difficulties and uh, his political career, uh, our cordiality remains, but I certainly don't claim any intimacy with him. He occasionally asks my advice on specific things, but I, I'm not part of his inner circle at all. If he is indeed leaving office this month, I think I would see more of him then. No, he's leaving office uh, this month. Um... Do you think we're going to miss Donald Trump? Uh, many people, uh, I think, will once once they reflect upon um, what he accomplished. I think he had next to Franklin D. Roosevelt and Abraham Lincoln and Richard Nixon the most successful first term of any president in history uh, of that country, um, and and most of what he achieved are things that are objectively approved of and are as policies supported by the majority of Americans. It's one of the reasons the Republicans did well in the congressional elections and out across the country. Uh, with that said, I think the concept of Trumpism without Trump is nonsense because no one who can put it over believably to that vast number of people who fervently support Trump and felt that they were ignored and not heard prior to him since Reagan. Um, <clears throat> but I mean, the Trump haters won't miss him, but the, the people who were persuaded to be anti-Trump just because of the general um, prevalence in, in, in many echelons of society, of hostility to him for stylistic reasons, I, I think will we'll reconsider their views. Uh, it, you know, absence makes the heart grow fonder, and it is the pattern that all American ex-presidents become popular. I used to have dinner with Mr. Nixon as an ex-president and uh, we couldn't go anywhere without people swarming him asking for autographs and 
congratulating him, saying what an honor it was to meet him. Uh, Herbert Hoover, in the year after he left office in the Great Depression, making way for Roosevelt, uh, it, as you see in Ken White's book, speaking of witnesses and for me in my case, uh, had to sort of skulk around almost in disguise at times for fear of being mocked or verbally abused in public. But I remember going to a baseball game in Cleveland, Ohio, in 1956, when his Do tend to be respected. I, I, I'm vigilant for the mute, but I don't know. There's some you just have a goblin out there that like a needs baseball us. Baseball coach giving a player a signal and you caught yeah. it. Uh, anyway, the, so yeah, I, I, I think I think I, I, I think a lot depends on what political stance he takes. I mean, um, nobody else can go anywhere in the country at a drop of a hat and pull. 20 or 30,000 people, regardless of the weather, to hear him. And, and as Henry Kissinger remarked to me a few weeks ago, he came to the United States in 1938. And in all that time, the only president who could do that apart from Trump was Roosevelt. And, and um, uh, if he wishes to be renominated in four years of his health is good, he can be renominated. And uh, I, I wouldn't count on this new regime to, I wouldn't count on them to inspire the country very much. But do, do, you, do you concede, though, that there certainly have been serious missteps by Donald Trump? For example, with Charlottesville saying they were talking about white supremacists, fine people on both sides. And there, there have been the tweets that he's done. So Charlottesville was nonsense. I, I, what, what he was saying, if you hear the whole tape, Steve, was that when it started, it was, it was a dispute between people who wanted to remove the statue of General Lee and people who wanted to keep it. And there were fine people on both sides. He condemned he condemned unequivocally the neo-Nazis and the Klansmen as he did Antifa and the, the militant, the violent part of BLM. Uh, he was sandbagged. Now he was reckless in the way he said it. Uh, he, should, he should have been there and in many other cases, much more careful about how he formulated his ideas. But, uh, but the, I, I mean, verbally, but the, the idea that Trump is a racist or a sexist, rubbish, absolute rubbish. No no, I, job I, I, I'm not suggesting that, but you know, like you studied American presidents and here's a president tweeting in the middle of the night, basically in a stream of consciousness, expounding on ideas and creating media fight, firestorms daily. I mean, you know, whether or not you, you agree with the substance of it, but he certainly put himself in a position where he was in the line of fire. We can agree with that, right, Conrad? Yeah, look, he, look he, in fairness, Steve, he had his style. I mean, no one else in the history of the country has been elected president without ever having sought or held any public office, elected or unelected, or, or a big military command. Right. And, and he did it by making himself famous, transferring the celebrity of his own personal brand to public office, taking over the Republicans, and replacing the media by a direct line through the social media, uh, you know, where he has in one way and another 250 million followers. And, and, uh, and, and so, I, in my opinion, once he got to be president, he, he, sh he should have turned into a president and been much more restrained and much more careful. But you know, to, to quote uh, FDR to General MacArthur, though it was doubtless a case of mistaken identity, the United States elected him president and not me. All right. Well, before I, I turn to my next question, th this is essentially live television, Conrad, and tonight uh, we have the Senate runoff in Georgia, and may, it may be a transformative moment in American politics. When we wake up tomorrow, the Democrats may control the Senate, control Congress, and have a Democratic president. Um, so what's your prediction? Uh, are we going to see that, or is it going to still remain Republican-controlled Senate? Oh, I've not been in the state of Georgia for 20 years, and I have no standing to answer, but since you asked me, I mean, no standing in the sense of being directly conversant with how things are going there, but um, my guess is that the Republicans will win both seats, and it will not be quite as close as people think, uh, and I don't think there is much doubt that there was a good deal of skullduggery in the Georgia election. They, 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 the fact that they pulled it out by 11,000 votes by exploiting the Stacey Abrams consent decree and the Ovid related um, alterations of uh, verification standards. And then they, you know, they, they 
middle of the night drops of lopsided votes from different places for uh, uh, for Biden, it, it raises real questions about that election. You won't have that this time. I mean, I have faith in Karl Rove, who's essentially running those campaigns, uh, to, to make sure it doesn't happen again. And I, I think what we're going to get is the normal Republican vote turning out en bloc to keep these two but by George's historic standards and the current standards of the whole country, very left-wing candidates out. And, and, uh, and you won't have the anti-Trump vote because they're not, no one's voting against Trump today. So I, I, I think the Republicans will hold it. Now, on, if, you, if you put the question to me, what do I think would happen if the Democrats won? Uh, I, I don't think they would get all their program through, but you would have all these, um, you know, have a dramatic shift in the, in the, uh, the, the orientation of, of uh, some of these committee chairmen and the way their committees were conducted, I think they would still have trouble getting their more radical legislation all the way through. But, but you certainly it would, yes, it would be a transformative change, but it'd be a disaster. It's a one-term, uh, you know, it'd be a one-term freakish effort. I mean, indeed a two-year one because the Republicans are almost certain to win the House of Representatives in two years. Uh, being asked a question in the chat room, it's a long question, so I'm going to have to condense it about the utility of, of the United Nations. And uh, and we know a lot of people think that it's it's, it's really a vapid organization that, that really uh, selectively enforces human rights. Uh, what's your view of the, the United Nations? I, I agree with the with the, that sentiment. I, uh, look, I, I it was set up by Roosevelt. He, uh, you know, in the in World War One, he had been a supporter of Wilson's and a member of his government. And he ran for vice president in 1920, supporting the League of Nations. He spoke. He went. The first school he went to was in Germany. He was educated at home until he was 12 years old, and and he, he spoke. He was the only American president who spoke German and French well, and he realized that. If the United States was not involved to some degree in Western Europe and the Far East, the whole Eurasian landmass could fall into the hands of anti-democratic forces hostile to America. So he was anti-isolationist all his adult life. And he devised the United Nations uh, and, and, and avoided all the errors of Woodrow Wilson, who didn't succeed in getting American adherence to the League of Nations, having invented the idea, uh, as a way of disguising through apparent collegiality America's Im immense influence in the world. So it wouldn't be the world feeling it was being dominated by America. And in reverse, reassuring those in the United States, descendants of people who fled uh, pogroms and oppression of all kinds and stratified class systems in Europe, uh, reassuring them that this was not involving them again in the quarrels of Europe and elsewhere that they or their ancestors had fled. And, and that was the idea of it. And the, the, for the first, you know, what, 20 years or so, 25 years, uh, uh, the United Nations, as it had been originally conceived, worked quite well because the Latin American countries did what the Americans told them to. The Commonwealth countries voted with the British. Uh, the, the, the French in 1958 created a lot of independent countries that voted as de Gaulle advised them to. and and you know, our side sort of controlled things, but it, is, it has since then become a kind of primal scream therapy room for every disreputable government in the world. And I think a lot of these agencies are corrupt. And I think the positions the General Assembly takes are frequently utterly outrageous and a mockery of everything the United Nations was founded for. Now, in my opinion, there's a role for Canada to lead a reform movement, but we're not doing it. But what it needs is for the responsible countries, and they're in, on all continents, to group together and require uh, some reasonable reforms and some reduction of, of hypocrisy, by which I mean the performance of the agencies and, and, and many of the delegations opposite the ostensible purposes at the founding of the United Nations. And, and we have the leverage to do it, starting with withholding of funds. If, if, if these people who trot around on behalf of these agencies, uh, absolutely desecrating the concepts they're supposedly upholding on behalf of the United Nations, didn't, didn't have the money to do it anymore, uh, they'd stop doing it. Conrad, um, let's just turn briefly to your criminal case and 
can we agree that um, that Mark Stein and I basically were the only two who correctly called your case at the beginning because uh, we we stood against a lot of people who thought you were going to be convicted on all counts, uh, believed in the government's case, and, and Mark and I uh, resisted that, looked at the case, uh, certainly in my case, clinically uh, as a lawyer, and came to the conclusion that it, that it really didn't um, stand and, and that I predicted you'd be acquitted of everything and, and largely was vindicated. Um, so can we can we just agree that uh, by the end of the day, that's where your results stood, that you were largely vindicated? Yeah, uh, and, and I, I'd add Christy Blatchford, the late Christy Blatchford. I, I, I think, I don't know about the very beginning, but certainly early on, she saw the whole thing as a scam. Uh, but uh, you three were, were you know, we, I was grateful for you. And, I, you know, Mark and I used to go to dinner many nights. We, I even got myself onto a menu in one of the restaurants there in Chicago. And we had a table in a couple of restaurants. And uh, uh, it, it, was, it was a lonely time, but I was, I was grateful for your support. Um, just let me say that it, it, as a practical matter, I have been vindicated. There were 17 counts. Four were abandoned. Nine were acquittals. Four, the, the remaining four were unanimously with one recusal, a former Solicitor General, so eight nothing and one recusal, vacated by the US Supreme Court. Uh, and then in that odd American way, they remanded it back to the circuit court uh, for, a, I quote, uh, Madam Justice Goldberg wrote the decision for the whole court, uh, assessment of the gravity of their errors. And she specifically named, and I quote again, the infirmity of invented law. And, uh, and the Supreme Court declared the law that they were acting on to be unconstitutional and ultra virus to the Congress. And, and then they purported to you know, retrieve two counts, but of those two, one was the improper receipt of $285,000 that had been voted by the independent directors and revealed in public filings twice, and which the trial judge said was a clerical error by Mark Kipnis. So, you know, how was I guilty? I wasn't is the answer. And the, and the other is this nonsense of uh, obstruction because I carried out boxes or with, with associates, I mean, with employees uh, of documents that, uh, that the court in Ontario ruled did not violate uh, the document retention orders. All of them had been in the hands of the SEC or copies of them. And I carried them at under security cameras that I had had installed saying as I did so, and a lip reader could verify this from the security camera tape, I want to go out the back door under the cameras so no one imagines we're doing anything surreptitious. I mean, and the local court, the court of initial jurisdiction in Ontario when it was put to them and put to the Crown Law Office, so there's nothing here to prosecute. Anyway, then, uh, so I was stuck with those two in theory, but they were bunk. And in the president's pardon, the White House Law Office, after examining the cases presented to them by Alan Dershowitz, who acted for me, uh, declared and authorized me to say, and the president himself said, that these charges should never have been laid, any of them. So right. yes, we were vindicated. You said that Judge... damn near killed me and I lost a lot of money in 20 years, but, it, but yes, we were vindicated. Yeah, you, you inadvertently said Judge Goldberg. I think it was Ruth Bader Ginsburg who wrote. Uh, uh, what did I say? Goldberg, by mistake. I beg your pardon. I beg your pardon. No, of no. course, yeah. Madam Justice Ginsburg. Yeah, sorry. And um, so, so the, the pardon comes. And um, are you going to go back to America? You, you weren't able to before. Can you go? Will you? I, look, I could have. Uh, and then the trial judge, Judge St. Eve, whom you recall, uh, right at the end said, you'd, all, you'd always be welcome in this country. And if you want a reference, uh, cite reference. this court. I mean, she, she was fine that way. I mean, I didn't think she was any thundering prize of a trial judge, but she was always very courteous. But um, uh, I, in order to do it, I would have had to apply for the privilege of entering the United States. And after the way I was treated there, I did not uh, for obvious reasons, see fit to to make such an application. Uh, I, I will return. Indeed, the president himself has invited me a couple of times, but I'll, I haven't got there yet, but I will. I will. I mean, obviously, we're now in times when travel is very complicated. So, so we have a question from Jeff, and uh, his question is about your time in prison. And he, he just I'm just going to quote what Jeff says. I quite enjoyed his writing for the National Post when he was in prison. He wrote about his teaching prisoners English or about literature. 
I was very impressed by that. I would love to hear him talk about if you could do this briefly, though, Cadre, I appreciate yeah. it. I'd love to talk about that experience. Now, I, I am fearful that my long answers have been too long, but you tend to ask no, me no, you mean wonderful. questions. Just I um, want to get more from you, that's all. Yeah, well, look, on, on that, I thank the man for his question. Uh, it, I must say that while it was an outrage, I was in a prison, I found it very interesting. Nobody bothered me. I got on well with everyone. I mean, as, as you know, Steve, I, I, I do get on with people that actually know me. And... Um, uh, it was a privilege to help these people, and it was an eye-opener to me. Uh, I had 204 people uh, uh, very rapidly. This Bureau of Prisons has a, has a system where anyone who was not matriculated from high school uh, is required to attempt to do so. And they have teachers that they recruit from among the inmates, as well as a few employees of the Bureau to teach them. And they run these uh, matriculation examinations every month. And the ones who failed were sent to me as a tutor. And I recruited a mathematics tutor who was a former commodities exchange dealer uh, and, and head of a mathematics department in a high school in Little Rock, Arkansas. And my sciences tutor was the former commander of the torpedo room of a nuclear submarine. So if I'm, and I did, uh, I did uh, English and history. So I, if I may say it, I think we were well qualified for what we were doing. And, and our, I, I, for my part, I had 204 uh, uh, of these people. And I'm proud to tell every one of my lads passed. Some of them had to take it more than once, but they all graduated. And a number of them, um, since the Bureau didn't have anything about universities there, I had my office send me some information and I helped them with their applications. And, and, and uh, six or seven of, of my 204 went on to university. And I had a, a note a while ago, a couple of years ago from somebody who had started as a correspondence student when he was released, continued physically and ultimately graduated from the University of Alabama. And, and uh, it was, it was, I didn't like, we all remember the good teachers we had when we were young and I had a few, but in general, I didn't like school and I didn't like teachers. And, and I never saw the attraction of the profession, but I must say it is very, very fulfilling to help people who need it and, and, and have it work. And I'll give the Bureau of Prisons this. They organized these graduation ceremonies and they were wonderfully heartwarming occasions. And whenever my wife came to visit me, which was every week, uh, people in the waiting room would say, you know, thank heavens for what your husband's doing for my son or my husband or my boyfriend or whatever it was. And, and uh, it, it, was, it, was, it was that and the fact that I was writing for the National Post and, and the National Review, Bill Buckley, William F. Buckley engaged me as a writer after I had been convicted as a show of solidarity. And I was writing for both of them and so, so I had a lot of readers and the combination of those two things made it psychologically much less oppressive than it would have been if I'd just been sitting there uh, with nothing to do. All right, so I just wanted to announce to our audience that, that graciously Conrad Black has agreed to go past the hour of eight o'clock. So we're gonna go a few minutes past. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you this very pressing question, Conrad. What was the item on the menu that was named after you? It was a, it was a kind of uh, feeling mignon. Okay. <laughs> and, and, uh, uh, there were two sizes, and before it was a filet mignon, Napoleon, which okay. this is this is really flattering that I was on the menu with you know the emperor of the French, uh, and, and so they they made the larger one and named it after me, which I, is not altogether flattering. But you know when you were going through what I was, I just kind of ignored dietary, uh, uh, normal dietary prudence. Okay. So I just want to announce again to our, our all of our viewers uh, that in two weeks, exact same time, 7 p.m. on a Tuesday, uh, our next speaker will, our next guest, I should say, will be John Baer, the form, former foreign minister of, of Canada and the conservative government of, of Stephen Harper. And I, I'm very much looking forward to interviewing uh, John. That's going to come just on the eve of uh, the inauguration of President Joe Biden. So we'll have a lot to talk about. So Conrad, here's my last question. I'm going to give you the names of various world leaders, prominent historical figures. And the challenge for you is in one sentence to describe them. All right. Are you ready for this challenge? Uh, yeah. I, before I do, I just want to say you'll have a very good time with John Baird. He's a very good friend of mine. I think he was a fine foreign minister, a great friend of Israel, as you know. And uh, yeah. so please give him my compliments. I haven't seen him for really since the onset of this virus. I give you my word, it'll be the first thing I do when I start the interview. So, so um, let's start with Benjamin Netanyahu. One sentence, what do you I, say? I, um, 
personally, I like him a great deal. I think he's been a very strong prime minister. I think he's been a force for economic modernization and he has respectabilized what was previously regarded as a, as a excessively severe or un, inflexible uh, liquid position. I think he's been a, a very distinguished leader and, yes. and, a, and he's a very good man, I like him. Let, let's go to uh, England. Uh, with just where it was just announced that they're in, in a severe lockdown until March, uh, Boris Johnson. Again, I know him very well. Uh, he, he, I sent him to Brussels as our correspondent, which is how he became famous. And I appointed him editor of The Spectator. I have great liking for Boris. He's an immense talent. He was the man to end uh, the, the, the terrible crisis of Europe, the worst fiasco of the parliamentary system since in Britain since the American Revolution. And, um, and he did it brilliantly. Uh, I think he will be a good prime minister, but he's starting from scratch. He's had no administrative experience. Uh, he's, a, he's a disorganized person, a helter skelter person as he looks. He exaggerates a bit in the way people do exaggerate characteristics for amusement and popularity, but he's very intelligent. He'll pick it up and I think he'll be a very successful prime minister. And, and, and I like him. He's, he's, he's look. He's he's a, he's dodgy, but it's he's impossible to dislike him if you know. Him. All right. Let's move to a former prime minister who's become more famous recently because of the Netflix drama, uh, The Crown. That's Margaret Thatcher, one of the great leaders of a thousand years of British history. A great leader, and uh, a, a person that I was personally indebted to for the support she gave us when we were following in the steps of Rupert Murdoch, and, but peacefully demanding uh, our, our business there and, and giving everyone generous pensions, but ending the terror of the shop stewards of the printing and, and printing trade unions. And, um, uh, but uh, she, look, she came into a Britain that was under daily audit from the IMF, it was in absolute shambles. Everybody was on strike all the time. Even the undertakers were on strike. You couldn't carry the dead out. It was an absolute uh, unrecognizable wreck of a country. And, and she, she brought it back to a position of world significance and was instrumental in the satisfactory end of the Cold War. Uh, look, she was no barrel of laughs. She didn't have a wonderful sense of humor. That's not Bibi's strong point either, unlike Boris. But but that's not the issue. She was a great statesman, and she was always a very, very great supportive friend of mine. I, I have nothing but admiration for her. And Dennis, Dennis was the backbone of the British nation. He was it's he was husband. the great. He was the Jen, Dennis Thatcher. Uh, her husband. Yeah, I went to her last nomination meeting. She was nine consecutive terms in Finchley. And uh, somebody got up and said, what about Sir Dennis's drinking problem? So she, she called him DT. She said, DT, do you want to deal with that? And he lumbered up to the podium and said, I don't have a problem. I just like it. I mean, he was wonderful. He was Britain. He, went a lot of, he, was, he was cricket playing, gin and tonic, upper middle class Britain. Wonderful man. We have two more names to go, Conrad, and they're, they're <laughs> big ones. Um, so the first one is Joe Biden, who will be President Joe Biden. In a yeah, well, I, I don't, I've never met him. Look, he, he's a journeyman. I understand for, from everybody, and I don't have any trouble uh, believing this, that he's personally quite an amiable man. I mean, look, frankly, Steve, most politicians are, otherwise they're in the wrong business. You know, they should take up dry cleaning or something. I mean, most politicians are quite equitable people. Um, but but he's uh, he has no convictions. I mean, he's faced in all four directions on every issue, and and uh, he, he I, I think he has to be credited with survivorship and political agility. I mean, it's a, uh, for a man who never got more than one or two percent when he ran for the presidential nomination of his party prior to being vice president. Uh, just just by hanging in there, he, he I mean, he's a kind of a Jean Chrétien, although I I think not as astute as Jean Chrétien, but um, uh, he, he's, he's very limited compared to these others we talked about. Uh, you know, I wish, I always hope that whoever the president of the U.S. does well, but I, 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 I would, given the apparent evidence of cognitive deterioration and given his great difficulty clinging to anything, even religious principles, and he was a man who almost fought funding for abortion, and, and it's not quite cheerfully in favor of 
prosecuting the little sisters of the poor if they don't pay for the abortions of their students and employees. I mean, I'm not getting into the abortion issue. I'm just saying people shouldn't move around as much as he does. But I, I, I wish him well, but I'm prepared to fear the worst. But I, I don't know him, unlike the others you mentioned. All right. So um, we have an expression in, in Hebrew, which is the last is the dearest. And so we're going to come right to home and to our leader, uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Yeah, uh, look, I like him as a person. He is a genuinely nice man. I knew his father quite well, and I, I don't think you would say quite the same of him. He, he was he was a sharp. I mean, I enjoyed him, uh, but but he was a sharpish and and rather cold man. I'd say Justin is, as he appears, a genuine, likable man. He's interested in people, and he likes people. Uh, I don't think he's done a good job as prime minister. I think he's been a pretty competent liberal leader. I mean, he has won two terms in a row. He brought them back from third place all the way into government, which I don't think was ever done federally in this country before, to go from party number three to party number one in one election. And um, uh, and, and he, he outsmarted the NDP in Quebec, uh, Mulcair. He took Quebec back from the NDP. So I, I think he deserves some credit electorally and politically. But I, I think he's allowed himself to be bogged down in, in, in essentially a confined policy area of native rights, gender issues, a very alarmist view of climate. Uh, and and, and it, it's, it's not, you know, I just don't think it's working. I don't think it's a government that has a good record. But uh, he's, he's a good man, but I don't, I, don't think he's a, I don't think he's a good prime minister. All right. Well, I just wanted to uh, say that uh, we've certainly had um, strong views, um, well thought out, incisive, and engaging, and it's been enjoyable for me to interview you in an honor. And, and I wanted to thank you on behalf of all the synagogues involved, Beth Shalom Synagogue, that is, is the, the chief host of this program, uh, for you giving of your time and spending your part of your evening with us. It's greatly appreciated. And I'm speaking on behalf of everyone who's listened in tonight. So thank you, Conrad. Thank you, uh, Lord Black, for participating in Evenings with Steve. Steve, the pleasure is mine. I thank you and thank all of the people. I mean, I'm, I'm taking your word for it. There's somebody's out there. I see four people, five people. I, you yeah, can tell me there are hundreds. Yeah. I'm, I'm flattered to hear it. But anyway, anyway, I see the watching, number. I see the number. For, thank you for it. And so thanks for us. Good to see you again, Steve. My pleasure. Thank you to everyone. And we'll see you in two weeks with John Baird. Evenings with Steve. Have a great evening. Take care. Thank you.